Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to this session um, at the WOW Festival. I hope you're having an amazing time. Um, for the next hour or so, I'm going to be taking you through quite an inspiring, I hope an inspiring, sporting panel of women here to discuss equality in sport. Um, just before I introduce them, and they, all three of them are amazing, I wanted to introduce myself. My name's Jeanette Kwachi. Um, I'm a former Great Britain Olympic sprinter, so I run very fast, not in the hills that I'm in today, <laughs> ideally in trainers. Um, but I, re I retired about two years ago, and I now have moved into sports media and sports journalism with my focus being on women's sport. Um, so it's quite interesting when I got the brief about these three women that are here today because not having retired that long ago, I understand some of the things that they'll be going through now as modern day sports women. So it was quite important for me to get them out here for them to really talk to you about some of the things that we, there, that we therefore go through. So without further ado, um, all three of them are going to tell you a bit about themselves before we get stuck into the crux of the matter. And I think we'll start here with beautiful, lovely Ambreen Sadiq. Um, if I could ask you to give her a massive round of applause, please. Thank you. Now, Ambreen Sadiq, is a, she's a boxer. Doesn't look like your average boxer, does she? <laughs> um, and Ambreen, please, tell the crowd. Um, yep, my name is Ambreen. Uh, I've been boxing for almost eight years now. Um, I'm uh, the first female uh, Asian Muslim girl to box in the UK. And I was a national champion when I was 16. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I know. Definitely a round of applause. Now, for Ambreen, um, we're going to go into her story a little bit more, but um, she's just telling me backstage she's got ambitions to fight at Rio 2016. And she's also in the same category as Nicola Adams, and that's a fight I'd like to see. <laughs> so um, I'll be following your training now just to yeah. see how far you're getting. And next to Ambreen, we have Susie Rogers. Round of applause, please, for Susie. Susie is a Paralympic swimmer, um, three-time medalist at the London 2012 Olympics. I think that deserves another round of applause. And Susie, I will let you tell the crowd what you do. Uh, yeah, just to say thanks to uh, Jeanette for um, hosting the panel. And um, it's really inspiring to be sitting with these two ladies here today. Um, I'm a Paralympic swimmer. Um, I've been competing with Team GB now since 2011. Uh, I've won a total of 20 international medals. Um, my most sort of proudest achievement really is um, winning the three bronze medals at uh, London 2012. And I've got one of them here with me today, protected in front of me. <laughs> can, you sh can, you, can you show the crowd your medal, please? Susie? I'll show. I'll show the medal. <laughs> Staying in its box. Yeah, we want a nice. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, I've been competing quite a while now and aim, hopefully, to um, try and qualify for the team for the Paralympics in Rio next year. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And next to Susie, we have Sharani Garami. She told me how to say her name properly as well. Garami, not Jurami. <laughs> Thank you very much for telling me because I'm very particular about names. Now, she is incredible. She's from Iran originally and she's a triathlete. She told me backstage she took up triathlon as a hobby. Now, for those of you who know what a triathlon is, it's not necessarily something you take up as a hobby. So you need to tell us how it went from a hobby to where you are now. Yeah, please, round of applause. <laughs> I haven't said anything. <laughs> um, it seemed like a challenge and I thought I'd give it a go. Um, and then I liked it. And then... <laughs> I don't know. I got, I got stuck. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I've never heard of anybody getting stuck doing a triathlon. And you also told us backstage that you've done a, a half Ironman. Now, for those in the audience who don't know what those distances are, could you give us an idea of what a half Ironman actually entails? Well, triathlon is swimming, cycling and running, and you have different distances. Um, a half Ironman is a distance of a 2K swim, 90K cycle and a 20 Three, I think, maybe 21k run. Wow, and how long would something like that take you? Depends on the course, depends okay. on the environmental factors. Really? I'm not coming with you next time, ever, <laughs> ever, ever. I'm a sprinter, I know my strength, so I'll stick to 100 meters, thank you. 
But anyway, we're going we're gonna to get down to it. Now, I thought the best way to look at something like this and how equality can be a firm part of women's sport, it, for me, was to break it down. Let's look at the barriers, and that's quite important. Um, in October last year, I wrote an article for the Guardian newspaper where I spoke about having equality in pay in women's sport. And we all know that footballers get a phenomenal amount of money, male footballers do. But then when you look at female footballers, a central contract as an England women's footballer, you get paid 20,000 pounds. There are international, well, there are premiership footballers who get paid that for half an hour. Okay, so when I wrote the article and called for that gulf to be, to be, to be smaller, I could not believe the criticism I got back. And I was shocked. And I couldn't understand why people felt so strongly that women should not be allowed to be on an equal par with men. With some men actually saying to me, women's sport is like a charity. I couldn't believe it. For someone who had crafted their career for so long to be then told that, it was devastating for me to hear that my own people from the UK believe that. So, ladies, what I want to put to you today about the barriers that face women in sport. Let's look at equality from a financial perspective. Let's be honest, because sport, when it comes down to it, is a big business. Are you in it for the money? Or are you in it for the love? Shireen. To give a little bit more background to what I do before I can talk about that, is that in the World Championships that was happening in London 2013, I became the first female to represent Iran. Prior to that, uh, women were not permitted to participate in triathlons. And prior to that, there was no Iranian female that represented Iran officially. So I went there and I said, um, can I please race in this race? And the initial reaction was, well, we don't have a team. Women don't do this and therefore no. Um, and it was a few months of talking and kind of thinking about the barriers and how we could overcome them um, before I was allowed to race. So coming from that background, of course, there's no financial rewards whatsoever. It's the love, it's the joy, it's the ability to do triathlons and participate in races. So you speak about, was it the Iranian governing body or the Iranian government that were giving you that resistance? Um, for triathlons, there's the National Federation, i.e. the Iranian Federa Triathlon Federation, and also the Sports Ministry, which is more of a government body. What were some of the, pro what some of the processes you had to go through to break down those barriers just for you to be able to compete? Because um, you can tell the crowd, you actually designed your own outfit because there, there, was, there was a restriction around what you could wear as a triathlete. Well, I don't know if anyone's seen triathletes um, compete, but they wear very tight, very little lycra. Um, and to compete for a run, um, I obviously have to respect and abide to the rules and conditions. And as a woman, kind of what I wear as a woman um, is part of the rules and conditions. Therefore, competing in the standard kit is not an option. And therefore, it's, it was... a you know, I think it took me about six months of trying to find something that balanced um, athletic performance and getting the permission. And it's still an ongoing story. And as we talk, I'm still thinking about it and still designing. And thankfully, I've got people helping me nowadays to design the code. Fantastic. Susie, give us some of the barriers that you've had to overcome now. Um, you're a Paralympic athlete. Maybe first of all, give us some background into your disability. Yeah, so my disability, I was um, born uh, without the lower part of my left leg and the lower part of my uh, left arm, so I wear artificial limbs on the left side, and I also have a deformity of the right foot. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say necessarily, because I got into sport a little bit later, um, I think I sort of had more confidence to sort of challenge any sort of discrimination that came my way, but certainly I know that you know, my mum, who's actually sitting in the audience, has faced uh, difficulties and has had to overcome obstacles because of my disability, you know, on my behalf um, as a child. So, you know, it happens, it does happen, it has happened to me. 
Um, but, you know, I take a lot of positives from it, really, and it's never particularly held me back. So there, there is a perception that actually some disabled athletes are held back, they're discriminated against, but it's not something you say that you've experienced to that degree. Um, I, have, I have experienced discrimination in that I've had coaches not want to work with me because they've not thought that I was quick enough because I can't go the same time as an able-bodied athlete. Um, but I usually take it to be their ignorance rather than, you know, anything that I've done. Um, and if they actually understood the sport or learned a bit more about it, that they would realise that, you know, in the context of my physical ability, you know, I'm hopefully not too bad, you know. So I, I guess I don't, I, I sort of have a different perspective of looking at it. So, yeah. Now, I don't, I don't know about some of you in the audience, but when you watch the Paralympics at London 2012, for me, there appears to be more of a legacy for the Paralympics than there was in the Olympics. Because we took an understanding that actually disabled athletes, there, there isn't much disability about them because they're doing phenomenal things. Tell me how that's affected um, participation now with young yeah. girls. Do you see the actual grassroots improving with young people coming through and those barriers being broken down because of London 2012? Um, I think to a certain extent, yes. but. I think there's still a long way to go. There's still a lot of people potentially with disabilities that are put off doing sport because they may have difficulties that they feel they can't overcome. Um, but there has been an increase in, in, I would say, support and interest. But I still think it would be great for it to be, to be you know, improved further, really. Um, better coverage, equality. We still don't get paid the same amount that, that Olympic athletes get paid. Um, you know, and that isn't even a gender thing. It's it's Olympic versus Paralympic. So, uh, it would be good for us to move forward in that respect. So that there's equality, and people recognise that actually we work just as hard. You know, the same as any athlete. There's no difference. It's just that we're physically restricted. Okay. Um, Ambreen, tell us, for you, what have been the barriers becoming a Muslim female boxer? Because we have Amir Khan, he's a man, he's a, he's a Muslim boxer, he's a great boxer, everybody loves him. Have you had much resistance yourself? Um, great, when, when I first started boxing at 13, um, I didn't even know that women could compete. It was, it, was, it was such a new thing, like when I went in it was just sort of, you know, my brother just goes, let's go, let's go down to the boxing gym. So at that time I had no idea that women could even compete. And so um, my, one day my coach came up to me and said, do you want to? Do you want to fight? Do you want? Do you want to compete? And I was like, what? Can can, can women even? Can girls even compete? Like, uh, so I researched it. I went. I went home and I googled it and I found Leila Ali, uh, which is Muhammad Ali's daughter, and she's a world champion boxer. And she actually, um, you know, she she boxed without her dad's permission. Her dad actually didn't want her to box, which is quite like, you know, I was quite shocked by that. Um, but w w when I decided to actually compete when I was 15, when I had my first fight. Um, it was more um, of a thing like, why are you boxing? It's a boy sport. Who would give you that, who would give you that resistance? Who said to you, why? Who it told was, you that? It was a lot of people, like uh, people in the street. Um, do you know, like um, I was in the newspaper, like, local newspapers as well. So people will pick up the newspaper and they'll know who I was and they'll come up to me or my parents and say, you know, why are you boxing? It's a boy sport, you know. And they'll go up to my parents and say, why are you letting your daughter box? She, she's a girl. And... It was sort of just, you know, um, breaking down the barriers and, you know, boxing's not just a boy sport, it's a girl sport as well, so you can't stereotype it as that. Um, and also it was the clothing, um, you know, as a Muslim, you have to cover yourself. And, you know, it was about wearing, you know, the vest and the shorts. And people sort of, you know, um, this, I don't know why, but for some reason they thought I'd, I'd actually go into the boxing ring to look sexy. And that's the, that's the last thing you, you know, you, you, that's the last thing you look when you're in the boxing ring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, again, the, the breaking down the barrier with, you know, um, the stereotype of that it's, it's a boy sport. Um, it, it was hard, you know, I was only 15 at the time. So I had the support of my mom, uh, my dad as well, you know, and the support of my family as well. So like what they actually tried to do is, uh, especially with the clothing, we actually went to my uh, local mosque. And we actually um, researched it. We asked our, our imam, and the imam and the peer said, he's, they said, if a man can box, a woman can also box. Wow. So if, you know, in Islam, uh, it teaches that men and women are treated equally. So if, like I said, a man can box, a woman can also box. And 
my intentions to wear the outfit. So it's like a uniform. So if I was a police officer, if I was a doctor, I have to, I have to wear a uniform. And it's the same thing as boxing. Shorts and a vest is a uniform. So my intentions are clean. So by explaining that to people around me, people understood. Again, I, this was eight years ago we're talking about. So back then it was very new. And I think people took it as a bit of a shock because it was something new that, you know, they'd never heard of. Right. So again, it's just... Was, it was the thing it was just trying to make them understand so by making them understand and getting uh, you know research and getting knowledge from the high people so such as my mom I think people definitely you know took that as yeah you can do it you know women can box that's really interesting that they took the imam's word and said okay fine as long as he said it yeah then you're absolutely fine yeah. to wear what you need to be able to competing I find that I find that fascinating now there were loads of highs and lows actually for women's sport especially last year and at the start of this year actually I think some of the highs for me were the fact that the, the women's rugby team they won the world cup the women's yeah wow you know I know um I know Maggie Alfonsi who was on that team and she's a she's listen she's not to be played with that woman wow they were amazing the women's cricket team they won the ashes listen we've got a lot to celebrate it was absolutely fantastic in the athletics the girls did amazingly well and they're still doing you know, just as good now. And I think for me, it kind of, it was a bit of a comeback after 2012 because we had the Jessica Ennis Hill who catapulted great British women up there when it came down to sport. It went a bit quiet. I think we had a little bit of an Olympic hangover. And then in 2014 with the Commonwealth Games and everything else, that was, that was when it kind of, it came back into play. And that was quite important, but there have been lows. We can't ignore that. There have been lows. According to research, 14% of young girls are involved in sport. What about the other 86? What's going on there? Why are we not able to push them through into activity past the age of school? That's quite important for me, okay? We had our sports minister, Helen Grant, now a massive advocate for female sport, but she came out with a comment that upset a few people where she said, why don't women do more feminine sports? What's a feminine sport? She went on to quote the feminine sports. Let me tell you, roller skating, <laughs> ballet. I did ballet when I was five. It didn't float my boat. So I said to my mum, I want to try something else. We have barriers all over the place, okay? And sometimes the media, politicians, they become those barriers. So I want to ask the panel, I'll start with you, Susie. I want to ask the panel, how do we react when we hear things like that. Our sports minister, a woman, has said, hey, go and do a bit of cheerleading, Susie. Forget all that boxing, Ambreen. Do some cheerleading. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite sad, really, that someone can say that this day and age. You know, I mean, it, you know, I'm sitting next to a female boxer here. You know, I, I, love, I love boxing. I'm always trying to get my gym coach to do a bit more fighting, and he just doesn't want me to injure myself. But, um, yeah, I, I just don't really understand that if you have a specific sport that you feel compelled to do why not try it even if it is something that is deemed as more masculine um because you know you could be really good at it i think any kind of sport that someone wants to get involved in let's encourage women to do it and let's not put any barriers there at all you know i i it baffles me really shireen what do you think do you think that if someone said to you oh forget that triathlon why are you running around doing that triathlon you know, go and do some roller skating. What would you say? You would not want to see me roller skating. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to have a good laugh. <laughs> and it's true, you know, not everybody is suited to those kind of sports. And that's important that we don't pigeonhole young girls to think that those are the kind of things that they want to do if they don't want to get muscles. Now, let's talk about muscles because when you box, that's what you get. You're going to get muscles. I had that problem when I was 15, 16. A crazy body image problem whereby... You know, my calves were getting bigger, I was, my arms were getting bigger, all from the training, and I didn't like it. I found that really, really tough. Do we need more mechanisms in place to try and tell girls, actually, it's okay to look like that if you're going to compete at the highest level? Yeah, I mean, um, I, w I was actually doing a, a workshop with some schoolgirls the other day, and one of the questions were, you know, do you, do you go into the boxing room with makeup on and stuff like that? And I was like, it, some people, I actually know a few female boxers that do actually go in the ring with makeup on but it's just practical you know you know you don't you, it's, it's not about your looks and 
the thing about you know the sports minister, sports minister saying you know that they should do a girl sport it quite upsets me because people you know when people say stuff like that it's that's why the girls do feel um that way as in you know i, sh- I want to do a girl sport because i don't want to have muscles mm. and it, it it upsets me because people like that they don't understand how we feel when we compete they don't understand the passion and the love that we feel yeah. and um i think that's one of the things that annoys me and you know, it's, with body image, it's, it's so hard because, you know, people see celebrities, especially young girls, they see, you know, celebrities, you know, looking really nice and really feminine. But it's, you don't have to look like that to look good. You know, what's wrong with a bit of muscle, you know? What is wrong with the muscles? No, I think that definitely deserves a round of applause. It's so true. Whenever I go into schools to work with young people, one of the questions they ask me, have you got a six pack? Now, I'm not going to show my stomach to young children at school. It's totally inappropriate. So I'll show them a picture of Google. They're like, oh, my God. I'm like, yeah, it's not there anymore. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so on that note, let's think about the media and the barriers that maybe they kind of put in place for women's sport. Now, we look at someone like Jessica Ennis-Hill, and she, like we say, she's phenomenal. She's the case study. She's a blueprint in terms of what can be done for female sport in the UK. Um, from a media perspective, they absolutely loved her. She's not the only female athlete out there. Why are we not taking it on board to get more women out there and break down those barriers so more women feel like they can go out there and do it? Shireen. I missed your question. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Why are we not using more women in the media to go out there and actually promote and push all types of sports, why we don't just concentrate on the one who actually looks good? Get back to me. I'm coming back to Shireen. Susie. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> um, yeah, this is one of my slight issues with the media. Um, I don't want to insult anyone who works in the media, but I do think, unfortunately, there is a kind of a desire to put that sort of body perfect image out there. And obviously, someone with a disability, I feel that that's inherently wrong. Um, but it's hard to challenge that because there's something attractive about looking at an image of a beautiful person. It, you know, it's, it's something that we're naturally drawn to as humans. So it's a hard, it's a, it's a tough one to talk about really, but I think there has been some effort definitely to improve that. There are certain companies that are using, you know, sort of more inclusive models, bigger size models, that kind of thing. And I think that's a step forward. Um, but it's still only gimmicky and happens occasionally, and it would be nice to see it sort of more mainstream. I mean, Jessica Ennis-Hill is fantastic and a a brilliant role model for women. She's also incredibly beautiful and has a lovely figure. So, you know, it's it's great, but it would be good to just showcase a lot of, uh, sort of a bigger spectrum, really. A range. Can I just ask the audience, actually, how many of you have seen the This Girl Can campaign? Can I just get a show of hands? Okay. Um, okay, now this is just for the women. Sorry to discriminate against the men in the room. When you watch that advert, how many of you actually related to it? Okay, a fair amount. Now, I found that quite interesting because the campaign actually it gathered a lot of momentum and a lot of women were very much, oh, this is amazing, this is great because this is how we feel when we take part in sport. Do you think, have you seen it, um, yeah, Amberin? Do you too. think that's a way forward in terms of pushing you know, the realistic expectations of females in sport? Definitely, um, I definitely do think uh, women need to encourage women. Um, I think especially when it comes to sports and trying new sports, women and young girls do feel intimidated and they feel sort of anxiety getting into trying them sports. It's, uh, uh, I think like my sister's, uh, she's 15 now and she wants to try everything, but she still needs that little bit of encouragement. She still needs someone, to, you know, someone to sort of give her that little push to go there and do it. Like I've spoken to many girls, I coach as well, and I've spoken to many girls that are, you know, they come up to me and they, they say, how, how can you just go and do it? You know, why is it so easy for you and so hard for us? But it's, again, it's just, they just need that encouragement just to go and try it out. Mm. And I think, again, it's just that intimidation, uh, getting past that intimidated feeling where, you know, I don't know whether I should do this because of this or because of this, people are going to look at me. It's like when, when you walk into a boxing gym, a lot of the girls feel intimidated because they think it's a boy sport. Mm. And they, they'd go in and think, that boy's going to think this of me, they're going to think that of me. And I've explained to them so many times, like, 
When, when you walk into that gym, you're not a girl, you're not a boy, you're not a child, you're not an older person, you're a boxer. You know, I always make sure I, you know, I tell them this, as soon as you walk into that boxing gym, you are classed as a boxer, not as a girl, not boy, you're not stereotyped as anything, you're just a boxer. And that, that's amazing for me, because then you have to look at the type of experience you then have as a young person, because then that acts as a barrier. And just before we move on to the mental side of things, one more on barriers. I want to speak about your experiences as a young girl, your experiences at school. And it'd be interesting, actually, Shireen, for somebody who grew up in Iran, what physical education was for you? What, what did it entail? What did it mean for little girls in Iran? Unfortunately, physical education did not exist. There was, you know, an hour a week that we had physical education, in which I personally read a book and the other girls sat in the lawn and chatted and wow. ate and something. Once we were taken up to the mountain and we were told to walk and about half a kilometre later we were all splattered on the floor and able to walk a single step further. Um, unfortunately it didn't exist much. Mm. It is there in the schedule but it's not, in, it, it's not very active. And it's not encouraged. So do you think that that, how much of an effect has, does that have then on the female population in Iran when you see that that wasn't the norm at school? I think it becomes part of a lifestyle. Sport is a lifestyle. So if it's not implemented at a young age, if you're not um, exposed to the life, lifestyle or introduced to it, then to, it's a bit harder to get into it at an older age, I suppose. Mm. Now, that brings me on to my, to my next part of this discussion. We spoke about in, in detail about the barriers. So what about the mechanisms as a woman that you then have to put in place to overcome those barriers? That's quite important because it's not just about, you know, overcoming the barriers and once you've done it, you're like, oh, what next? What's your plan? What have you actually thought about doing to push forward and push through with that? So a question I want to put to you, um, um, Ambrin, is tell me when you went into the boxing ring for the first time, and you saw that actually you've been allowed to box now. How do you keep going? What's your motivation when everything seems to be so against you? I think um, it was just the support from my family as well. Um, like when I first started sparring, I was probably about 14. And I actually sparred with my brother just to make myself feel comfortable. But um, when, again, I had to actually uh, go to different gyms to spar other girls because there was, not, there was no girls in the gym. And there was only uh, one other girl called Jess. And um, we always have to box and spar people in the same weight category. And uh, Jess was a heavier boxer. So for me and, for me and her to spar was, a, it was quite hard. And we wouldn't really be boxing someone that's that weight. So I had, me, my coach had to sort of get us to travel up and down the country just to find someone to spar. So that's just for the training, not just that's for the fighting, just for the for training. The training yeah. Wow. Okay. So, uh, just, just uh, you know, getting, um, just travelling just to find someone. Like I said, it took me two years to find someone to fight. So, like, I was training since I was 13 and I had my first fight when I was 15. Just because I couldn't find no one that was my weight and age. And we finally found someone and it was the best feeling ever. And it was just, again, you just have to put that little bit of extra effort in to find something. So, I think, again, breaking down that barrier is sort of, you know, finding different ways to break down the barrier, finding different ways to sort of achieve your goal. So like I said, like, I couldn't even find someone to fight. So for two years, I was looking. I was, I was online myself, I was looking for other clubs, other boxers. Look at that, looking for people to fight. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it, exactly. So it was, again, eight years ago, there was, they were, like, I didn't know myself that women could compete, so I doubt other women knew themselves. So it's, again, it was getting the word out there and putting it on Facebook and social media, you know, websites and stuff, sort of getting it out there, getting, you know, that interest up. And sort of, you know, um, I really look up to Nicola Adams as well. I think she's a very, very big inspiration to young women. Uh, you know, first, first uh, British woman to box in the Olympics and winning gold and also winning gold in the Commonwealth Games. I think as soon as she sort of hit the 2012 Games, women's boxing proper, it, it just sort of, it was so popular then and everybody sort of knew about it. It was, again, it's just getting, getting it out there, getting the word out there. So was that, a lot of that was your motivation? Definitely, doing that yeah, motivation definitely. I, I wanted to see more girls doing it because, like I said, myself, when I first started boxing, I didn't know that women could compete. 
So my goal and was getting more people to, you know, girls to come so I could fight them. <laughs> <laughs> but what we do want to know, that first fight that you had when you were 15, did you win it? I won it, and I also won, I also won Boxer of the Night as well. Look at that. Round of applause, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I definitely think so. <laughs> Susie, now, for you, what's your motivation? Because we were talking backstage with your mum, and I, I remember when I was talking about when I was younger, and um, as a little black girl, when we had to do primary school swimming, it was my worst nightmare. Because A, it meant that I'd be thrown into this pool, I could hold my own. When I came out of the pool, my afro... And it just meant that it would be hours for my mum to just do my hair. And it put me off and it put her off. And it's the smallest little things, those kind of barriers that push you in there. So I didn't need a mo no motivation to swim because I didn't want to do it. But for you, Susie, you, know, you, you came into swimming quite late. Tell us what your motivation was behind that. Um, well, I, I suppose I've always liked sport. Um, and it was finding a sport that physically I could do. Um, and my, my family encouraged me to do swimming because I wouldn't have to wear my artificial limbs. So I remember I first learned to swim when we lived in Egypt, and it was so hot that I wanted to be in the water all the time anyway. Um, and I just remembered that I felt an, an, in, an incredible sense of freedom, taking off my limbs and just being completely free in the water, exactly who I am. And I think that started off my, you know, my real passion for the water and being in the water and... I love the way it feels. I love the way when I'm moving through the water, it's just, I don't know, it sounds a bit spiritual, but it, it, it does feel like that and it becomes a passion, you know. Um, and that makes the training a lot easier when you're kind of getting up at five o'clock in the morning and throwing yourself in a cold pool. But then, of course, your motivation is the fact that you've got championships and, and those things coming up. Could you give um, our crowd just a little taste of what it takes to be in the elite mindset to get up and actually do that every day? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think you always have your goal, and I think a lot of people do this anyway in, in you know, work and things like that. It's goal setting and planning for things and, you know, having a project that you're working on and, and, and reaching it and doing everything you can to get there and make it successful. Um, and I think it's the same thing with elite sport, that you have to work very hard and be dedicated. You have to sacrifice, and people think it's a cliche, but it's not. You have to not go out late because you know you have to get up at five in the morning and you have to rest when you want to be going out with your friends and um but it, the rewards are, are there when you you know you get to do things like this or you know the offshoots from what you do and also from winning medals I mean I suppose the hardest thing I've ever faced in my life was standing in front of 17 and a half thousand people in the aquatic center at London 2012 and the raw of noise was just it like you know hairs on back of neck moment um and I knew my family were there I knew everybody was there cheering me on and it's it's an amazing uplifting feeling how no one could ever say that that was a negative experience you know even if you come forth it's still you know I did come forth in one of my races and people were yelling at me who they didn't know me oh well done you came forth and I was you know in tears because I'd not won a medal um but you know it, it's all perspective really and I think you know you learn a lot from experiences like that and you learn how to cope with it and that's why I carried on and that's why I want to carry on to next year because there's so much I learned from London that I wish I'd put in place then that I know I can do next time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a, a difficult question here. You've just explained to us an experience that I know all too well. Okay, crowds, lots at stake, family in the crowd, this is it, the highest part of your career. You are in the same exact space as an able-bodied athlete, but you don't get the equality, perhaps. Tell me, does that annoy you? Well, I mean, I, sp I suppose at the Paralympics, I'm not, you know, it's such a bubble. Um, and, I mean, I love my teammates. I love all of the athletes because they're such strong, inspiring people, all of them. Um, and we become like one little family. It doesn't bother us. The equality doesn't bother us when we're at a competition like that because... It is what it is. Um, when comparisons are made to the Olympics, then, you know, uh, that does bother us a little bit more. But I, I have to say that 2012 was, it was a step forward in equality, I think. Um, you know, we get a lot more recognition than we, than we did before. So, you know, I think, I think that's brilliant. And long may it continue and in other countries as well, because I know that we're quite lucky in the UK that people are quite aware. But, you know, there are other countries where Paralympic sport disabled athletes don't even get funding they have to work full-time to fund what they do so okay interesting 
And um, Shireen, with you, tell us what your motivation is, because it's, it's been tough, hasn't it? You have had to get out there as an Iranian athlete and prove as a woman, you can do it. What is your motivation behind that? What makes you wake up in the morning and say, right, I'm going out there to try my hardest and be the best I can, even though people don't necessarily agree with what I'm doing? I'll try and answer this question by trying to make, it, make up to the, to the question I did not answer. <laughs> Because the way we, descri we described it on that question, it was about the physicality of sport, about how you look, about the, the muscles you have or you don't have, the shape of the body that you have or not have, the afro or the frizz, in my case, that you have or you don't have. Um, but sport goes much deeper than that. It's about that sense of empowerment. It's about that ability to prove to yourself that you are capable, that you can be strong, that you can be competent when no one else believes in you. It's that ability to know that if you set yourself a goal and it seems so unachievable, if you work consistently, if you work with determination, if you keep on working despite falling down 10,000 times, you will ultimately get there. Okay. And for me, it is such an empowering feeling and I hope that through continuing to participate in triathlons, through continuing to represent Iran, I could encourage people, other, other women to take it up and actually experience the amazing thing that is sports. So that's your motivation. Do you, do you feel like you're inspiring potentially the next generation of female Iranian athletes? I hope so. Okay, I think you are. I think she is. You think she is? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, we're going to move on to moving forward, planning, because I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We could be here all day. Um, moving forward and planning with how we can push women's sport forward. I get asked this question all the time. Um, my fiancé actually said this to me in the car, and I nearly killed him. He said, um, my Sunday league team, as in his football Sunday league team, could beat the women's England football team. I think he was saying it for laughs. I hope he was, because I'm marrying him. <laughs> <laughs> and it literally turned into a full-blown argument in the car, but he was laughing. So I'm going to assume he was doing it to wind me up. But we need to change, let's be honest, with certain men, we need to change the perception of sport and how they view women's sport. That's very important. How important, I'm going to ask you ladies, how important are men when it comes down to the perception of women's sport? And how can, they, how can men actually help us move things forward? I think um, men automatically assume that they are better at everything in sport just because they're men, uh, which is not true, um, especially with boxing. <laughs> um, all my coaches that I've worked with, they've actually said that women are better boxers. So the reason why is because they listen. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Um, so yeah, especially with boxing, I think because it's a, a fighting sport, uh, you know, um, men automatically think they're better at it because they're men, whereas women actually train harder because and and they listen and they they want to know how to do it properly. They want to know how to punch, you know, the correct way. They want to know how to, uh, you know, put more power into the punches. And it's again, like I've worked with uh, so many coaches, and they've all said the same thing that women are better boxers. So I think it, it just getting the word out there is definitely one of the, you know, the, one of the ways that you know, I can get it out there. It's like so many times, like, especially when I first started sparring, I used to spar boys all the time because there wasn't, there wasn't any women. And they used to take it easy on me. And um, I used to say, you know, why, why are you taking it easy on me? And they would be like, because you're a girl. I'm like, no, I'm not a girl. I'm a boxer. So come on, give it some. I love it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so then they sort of started, you know, getting, you know, the whole idea of, you know, she's not a girl, she's a boxer. So um, they did, you know, give me, a, a, you know, a harder sort of spa. So, and I appreciate that, you know, I wasn't scared, like, well, they, they did it and I, I, I wasn't sort of scared. I wasn't intimidated by the boys. I was like, come on, I want, I want to knock you out. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I sort of see it as a challenge, especially when I spar with boys. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you it. So you, you actually feel like you want men to look at you and say, actually, it, yeah. I'm not a girl first. I'm actually a bo boxer. In this ring, I'm a boxer Definitely, first. because, uh, you know, especially, like I said, when I first started boxing, especially the boys that I used to spar with, they used to take it easy on me because they thought, you know, she's a girl. And I was like, no, don't take it easy on me. I want you to 
you know, push on I want you to, you know, push me. Or I explain to them, you know, how am I going to get better if you don't challenge me? So then they sort of thought about it and they were like, yeah, I get your point. <laughs> <laughs> so then, I, yeah, so then I started sparring with them and they, they never used to hold back and I never used to hold, hold back either. And we used to have a really good spar. Okay. And uh, it was, so that's, you so that's know, what you want from the men. Susie, what do definitely. you think men can do, I don't know, from a strategic maybe or a commercial perspective in the governing body to, 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 to bring forward that equality? Um, I think the most important thing is to get more women in positions of uh, performance directors of national governing bodies. Um, there aren't enough women. I went to a UK anti-doping conference a few months back. Uh, all of the sports were represented, 90% male right. audience um, of directors. And I think, you know, we need to get more women in the senior positions. So you have a philosophy where it should come from the top down? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Okay, which is interesting because that's two separate fights. So for the men that are in position at the moment, what can we do to make them realise that women's sport is inspiring, as we found out this afternoon, can be commercially viable, as we can see, but on a bigger scale? What would you say to those men that are in power at the moment? I think, I mean, there are certain sports that there is more awareness, definitely. I, I'm not going to tar all men with the same brush because it wouldn't be fair at all. Um, but, you know, there are certain sports that are specifically more male-dominated, male orientated the masculine sports, as it were. Um, and it would be sort of more awareness of, of, of the contribution that women within those sports make. For instance, we've got, you know, we've got a British weightlifting team here today, the women here. Um, I know the coach, Keith, you know, he coaches a lot of, of great female athletes. It's bringing those athletes up and giving them equal billing to the, to the men in particularly dominant male sports. Interesting. And Shireen, what do you think? How can, how can men help bring women's sport forward and push it forward? I think step one is that we have to help ourselves. We have to believe in ourselves and we have to overcome the barriers that we have within ourselves. When we overcome this barrier, when we change in us, then we can change everyone else. Interesting. Right, my final question before I hand over to the audience is going to be about the media. Again, with talking about actually... Do they glamorise sports women? Do they make us look sexy? Is there a thing of where we're not necessarily taken as seriously as the men because of how we look? How can we move forward from that? If you had to, if you could be editor in charge of The Sun, for example, one day, what would you change? Susie, I'll start with you. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> um, about media's perception of sport. Yeah, women's sport, absolutely. Women's yeah. sport. Um, I mean, I, I, I like things like the campaign that they have out at the moment. I think it's a shame that it does focus a little bit on looks again, because it's like, you know, one of them where a lady's punching and then she's like, but my nails are perfect under these boxing gloves. It's like, well, why has she got nail polish on? Why would she, you know, it, things like that, that I think, you know, fine, but I'm not, I'm not sure whether they've hit the right angle completely with that. I think it's just sort of, yeah, not, not sexualizing the imagery and, and not being about, you know, lithe young women running around who look perfect. It's, it's kind of having a more of a broader reach, which is, I guess, what we were saying earlier. And Breen, what would you like to see from the media when it comes down to female boxes, perhaps, in the papers? I think uh, when it comes to the media, I just don't think this should, again, it should come in, uh, you know, image the way people look in sport. Again, it shouldn't just it shouldn't actually be uh, something to talk about, really, because it, again, they have to think about the young young girls, especially like I said, I got a young sister uh, who's only 15 years old, and she looks up to people, and she watch you know she watches you know TV, and she sees all the celebrities looking all good, and you know, and I think I think the media definitely you know it sh again it's, it shouldn't be um, something they should cover. Okay. And I think uh, by doing those things. Do make especially young girls, you know, their self-esteem goes low, and I think it's just something they shouldn't really uh, concentrate. Is especially when it comes to sport, I think they should concentrate on the sport more about the way they look. So more about performance, less about definitely. Appearance. Yeah, okay. I think the performance is 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 that's what that's what's important here, not the way they look. Cause like outside of boxing, I I love getting my nails done, I love getting my hair done, I wear makeup. But when I'm in the ring, 
I don't bother with my nails. I don't, that's the last thing that I'm worrying about. I don't wear makeup because it's practical and I braid my hair back so my hair's out of the way. So I think, why, why should image come into it? Interesting. And um, Shireen, finally for you, what would you say to the editor that says, but people aren't interested in women's sport? I think if we are interested ourselves, if we love it, if we enjoy it, I think interest brings interest. So do you, when, you, when you say we, do you speak about the athletes or do you speak about the spectators that are there? I think if I as an athlete love it, then the spectator would love to watch me enjoy myself. Interesting. So I think it's a two-way thing. So we need more, more female fans perhaps to try and push the agenda or to drive the agenda? Or, yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Right, my final question. Sorry, I've got loads of questions. My final question. One piece of advice you would give to your younger self you've done pretty well so far anyway one piece of advice you give to your younger self when pushing through to become a top elite sportswoman i'll start with Amber. <laughs> i think you know when i first started boxing um i was more worried about what other people were going to say when they were watching me box and i was i was more i think when i first started it was more about proving a point and um more about what other people were saying you know sort of um Worrying about their judgment and worrying about their opinions. I think what I'd say back to, you know, when I, when I had my first fight, it was don't, don't, basically don't care about what other people are going to say. If you're happy doing it, you're going to be happy doing it. So there's no, you don't need to prove to anyone that you're happy doing it. If you're happy doing it, there's no need to prove to other people. They can see it. They can see it. Okay. So don't so, watch anybody. Concentrate yeah, on yourself. Exa- exactly. Okay. Yeah. Susie? Um, I would say don't don't feel that you have to follow the crowd or the prescribed route that society tells you to go down because when I was younger I thought that I had to you know get a nine-to-five job and and be a normal person and work in an office and I didn't think that sport could be a job at all for a woman let alone anything you know it, it, it particularly not a Paralympic athlete and it just kind of took off alongside another career I was developing and then it, it ended up taking over completely and it's changed my life direction so I would say that you you can't ever go with what you're told necessarily at school. It's not always the right advice for you and just, you know, see where life takes you, really. So go against the grain. Yeah, sometimes. You you are a rebel, Susie. (laughs) (laughs) And Shireen? I most certainly agree with everything that Susie said. And in addition to that, I would always tell myself, never tell yourself you can't before you've given it your all. Because you'll always surprise yourself. You'll always prove yourself wrong. Okay. Well... For me, I think I've asked enough questions. I think it deserves a round of applause. They were brilliant. Thank you. I just want to get a final point. A show of hands for women who actually do activity outside, um, in the park, in the gym, on the netball court. Let me see a show of hands. Okay. So we've got a fit crowd. <laughs> we have a fit crowd. And on that note, you all look lovely. <laughs> I do want to say thank you very much for listening to us for the last hour Massive round of applause for my panel, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.